Hello and welcome to another exciting lesson. Uh, we have quite an interesting one today. Another production problem that comes up very often in our commercial work. Namely, how to replace your sky in post-production without any artifacts, without rendering in double resolution, if you know what I mean. Uh, we'll show you a trick on how to do it perfectly and painlessly. Sunset is the main scenario for a sky replacement in post-production and that comes with a simple reason. Uh, it is pretty hard to find an HDRI that will illuminate the scene and have perfect clouds in it uh, to suit our composition. Most often it's either illumination or backplate. So we will delve deeper into what the clouds are all about, how to choose them for the composition both in terms of artistic and technical aspects. We have quite an extensive theory block this time around and tons of practice, lots of cool stuff. So let's get at it. Okay, the first thing that should always come to your mind anytime you're faced with a huge negative space is whether the clouds will be important or not. Simple as that. Is there already a lot going on in your image and it's better to leave the sky clear? Or maybe clouds will improve your composition or even build your composition. Through well-chosen clouds, we can really create a wow effect, especially while having super simple compositions. Check this example. Through this dynamic cloud, we have a really epic image, but without it, this composition is just a line which isn't that interesting at all. This is often the case with architecture. We can have dynamic cloud formations that will build an epic picture at a very low cost. On the other hand, sometimes our composition will be so overloaded that we won't need any additional clouds at all. A clear sky gradient is very often all you need for your negative space. Putting some additional composition elements could grab too much attention and will be just too much. So once again, we wonder if our picture needs clouds, even begging for them. We start with composition lines, just as we did before, and ask ourselves, do I even need clouds and how important are they as supposed to be? Don't force anything. You can use clouds to build an epic, epic image, but still you might destroy it 10 times more if you're not careful. Often, all you need is just a pure gradient in the sky and there is nothing wrong with that. Now, after deciding to introduce some clouds, we can start thinking about their type. Should you bet on something dynamic with strong contrast or on the contrary, something more homogeneous that creates indefinite noise? Now, the next part is kind of interesting. We will introduce several different types of clouds, kind of going back to school, but don't worry. We will not go through all the possible types of clouds here. We will introduce the most important ones according to creative reasons. Basic cloud knowledge can really go a long way, so let's start introducing them one by one. And the first cloud type we will be interested in is cumulus. Those are the white lamps in the sky that our clients, especially developers, often want in their cheerful sunny scenes. This is understandable. This type of cloud often enlivens the composition and adds more bright colors. Often, the image is just more uplifting when those types of clouds are present. When cumulus clouds appear, they remind us of summer and good weather. They usually come with points, blocks and spots, so you can use them however you like. But while using them, we need to be careful they can easily catch larger contrasts, so sometimes they can be too intense in our scenes. If we are looking for something lighter, we can reach for cirrus clouds. Those are generally clouds that are formed in the higher parts of the sky and are often very delicate, feathery ones. Their additional advantage is that they often arise in a more geometrical, elongated form. We can use them to build extra composition lines. Besides, they are just like I said, 
clouds that are often barely noticeable, and we can add a little nuance to the sky without overloading it with some contrast or very expressive shapes. A small side note here, contrails are also associated with cirrus clouds. That's the vapor trails that are produced by the aircraft at the same altitude as cirrus clouds. For us, however, it can be important that they are just typical straight lines. They can help us to build a composition if we need these lines to have some sort of guidance for our hero object. It is not used very often in visualization, but it's an additional composition tool, definitely worth considering. By the way, nothing prevents you from mixing those clouds. We often get a more dynamic composition where those clouds take place at different levels of the sky, especially if the sky has to play a bigger role in our composition. Keep in mind that cumulus clouds form lower and cirrus clouds arise higher. Similarly, not used too often, but uh, worth considering in terms of composition, are lenticular clouds. Less common in nature, which form in quite specific conditions, such as humid air over mountains. However, when we look at them with a dynamic camera, we often get very attractive forms that can be transferred into our composition. This type of cloud can immediately build an epic image. On the downside, there are not many backblades available on the market of this kind. So whenever you see one, just grab it. You never know when it turns out to be useful. Speaking about composition here, we have a little trick for you, which is showing the clouds in an extended exposure. Then, regardless of the cloud type, we end up with a movement that turns into lines. Just take a look at those examples. We can unify our sky a little. We don't have such strong, intense forms here anymore. And we get a lot of lines again, which are often just attractive for us. And the last cloud type that I think no one expects to put in a rendering is a storm cloud. It may not be the most intuitive choice if we want to show our architecture. However, they can build this dynamic, epic composition. These are clouds that are just soaring up with high contrast, very turbulent and visually appealing. We can build a composition in an instant if we decide to insert a cloud like that. It's kind of interesting if we think about it visually. And there's also something called a shelf cloud, which is connected with storm clouds. It may be phenomenon in itself, not very important to us. But again, we receive a very dynamic lines that can be transformed into an interesting composition. Especially since we operate on high contrast, we can easily split the image and make drastic composition changes this way. Okay, that's about it when it comes to cloud types that we wanted to share with you. By the way, it happens every so often that you need a specific cloud for a specific region. And you can even base an image on it if you will think about it in advance. Often, clouds are the last element in visualization that we do. But it could be the exact opposite. We can have a composition based on a cloud. Just look for some characteristics of the region you're visualizing, rethink the composition and build on its basis. For example, if we have a desert landscape, we rather expect a cloudless sky, a pure gradient. But if we approach a tropical landscape, we often expect to include numerous cumulus clouds. That immediately brings the heavenly look to your visualization, which your client just expects. Another example could be using cirrus clouds for the polar regions. Under those conditions, they form lower. It really takes a couple of minutes to wrap your head around it, and it's really cool to learn something more about the world during our work. There are clients from different parts of the world who may care about it even subconsciously. And don't get me wrong here. Generally, all types of clouds form almost everywhere. It's not like those cumulus clouds will form only in the tropics. 
but people can expect those conditions more often. If we want to reflect the nature of this place, uh, we might need a certain weather dynamics. Even if your client wouldn't notice that you did it on purpose, there's a good chance he'll catch it subconsciously and appreciate the extra touch. Okay, so just to make a brief summary, anytime you face a negative space in your image, we ask ourselves whether to introduce clouds there and how dynamic they should be. That should already give us a good idea about the clouds we are looking for. We'll start browsing through our resources very soon, but let's keep in mind that we should mentally kind of narrow our choices. This ability to make a quick decision about texture selection, or anything really, is essential to being a better artist. So the first question is where to get clouds for backplates? And there are many possible answers. The first is HDRIs. So again, you go to Chaos Cosmos, 3D Collective, or PG Skies, or any site we listed in our fifth lesson. Just as HDRI is used for illumination, you can just as well use it as our backplate. They are spherical maps, so we don't have to worry it doesn't match our focal length, and that's going to be a big deal, which we will talk about in just a moment. But instead of using an HDRI, you can just buy specific sky photos. For example, vishopper.com or mattepaint.com. If one suits us, we can buy or enter into a subscription model. Another option is whole packages on the ArtStation marketplace. There is an abundance of them and I use many of them myself. And here we specifically want to give a shout out to vendors like Photobash or ProEDU who have very high quality photos. Last but not least, we have all the stock pages, including the free ones we talked about before. Pixabay, Unsplash and such. Be careful though, not everything is possible to use commercially, so read if the license allows it. As we can see, we have access to a considerable amount of photos. And that's about it. We breezed through it, but I think it gives you a hang of it. Now we can get to the last part of this theoretical block. So let's discuss what makes a good backplate, both technically and artistically, just to be able to choose it quickly and ignore most of them even faster. And it's often the case we have thousands of different images to choose from. So what to look for, what to pay attention to, what to avoid and what problems can be. It will take some experience to do it without thinking we will give you a couple of ideas you should consider. Are the photos sharp? Do they have any burned out pixels? What's the resolution? There are some obvious aspects that we will cover first, and we will go through the not so obvious ones later. So then, the obvious thing is the resolution of the photo. The higher the resolution, the better. Remember that most of these photos are taken with some kind of APS-C or full-frame camera and you can expect the resolution to be of, say, 4K to 8K pixels over the long side. Panoramas or compilations of more photos can be even bigger. Going lower is not a good idea, but even then you can upscale the image. Upscaling using Gigapixel or any other similar software generally works well with clouds and can give you more resolution to play with. Another aspect we want to consider, which is kind of connected to resolution, is the sharpness. At high resolutions, these clouds can be very blurry and generally we don't want them to be. The camera will often not focus on the sky, especially as there are no contrasts on it. Here we have an example of where it lacks this sharpness. It may work out in some cases, but keep in mind that our 3D renderings come very sharp. We want to match colors to fit everything else in the frame, especially if we use some of these more dynamic cloud formations. Another thing that can potentially disqualify our choice is any loss of detail 
especially in illuminated parts of clouds. Oftentimes, the colors are just burned out and there's no way we can bring this color information back. And the last thing that can totally disqualify an image is flaring. If such a flare appears somewhere, it can disqualify a photo real fast, especially when it crosses the horizon. If we have a sun in the frame, we might just not be able to avoid it. This is how the optics of the camera work. And if we were to use it as a backplate, we will end up with a flare cut in half, since our 3D rendering will cover the better part of this image. Okay, at this stage, we have narrowed down our selection by a little. Once again, if you wonder what cloud type you're looking for, ignore those with aggressive flares and think about whether potential candidates are not too blurry. Try to use Gigapixel to upscale the resolution. And it is so much for the technical part. Now, let's move to the decisions you should make artistically. And another aspect is kind of on the border between the technical and artistic sides. You should choose the correct exposition or tonal ranges to be exact. Let me elaborate on what that really means, since it might sound a little confusing at first. Remember that the exposure of sky must match our scene. If we have a day scenario, the cloud will be probably the brightest element in our image, since it has an albedo comparable to snow. So we can test what the brightest parts of the clouds look like, especially those directly illuminated by the sun. For a commercial look, they shouldn't be gray, but regular happy bright white clouds. And the situation is a little bit more difficult with clouds to fit a sunset scenario. When we start to look for a sunset backplate, we enter a mindset of viewing photos from holidays and we are automatically attracted to the photos like this. And if we put this photo, it will quickly turn out that the exposure to the sky and the sun is so low that the whole scene should be almost black. We have a couple of examples using this kind of backplate and as we can see, we can play with silhouette of a building here and only in the scene, using this reflection on the stall, we get somehow drawn such a secondary detail. It creates a really nice atmosphere, however, most of the scenes are very specific and they are not commercial at all. We don't communicate anything about the building and the surroundings. Maybe this scenario will fit better for us, maybe not. But usually, we want to show our scene with a sun scenery, like this one here. And with a scene like ours, the sky just has to be a lot much brighter. So, usually, Go for something way brighter that should fit your purposes and fit the overall exposure of your scene. You will be able to adjust it later on, but it will be very difficult if the image exposure is very dark in the first place. Okay, another element is the direction of the sun. And to be more exact, which side of clouds are directly illuminated? If we put the sun on the right, we don't want clouds lit from the left. You might think it's obvious, but it's really not. If we replace something quickly in several shots, there is simply no time. Someone doesn't pay attention and bam, it goes out into the world. The wrong direction will immediately grab attention if you have strong contrast in the scene. Though we can kind of get away with it if the contrasts are pretty mellow in our images. Fun fact, we might even cheat a little bit and have the light coming from the side, but the clouds illuminated from below. That's an exception that works in a sunset scenario which we'll conveniently use today, but more on that later. Long story short, we are not looking for something perfect. As long as the direction matches the correct side, we should be good to go. Now, the next aspect is very important. While choosing a perfect cloud backplate, 
we have to match it with our camera focal length to fit the scene. So we need to know if we are looking for something more dynamic, which starts below 35 millimeters or rather flat. That's above that. By the way, we can right click on a picture and go to the properties. In details here, in the properties, we have some metadata. Of course, resolution, etc. But we can also have additional info about the lens. And here we have two values. We have a focal length and this is 35 millimeters focal length. And this is what we generally set on the camera and in 3ds Max. So we look at this value and that's what we should expect. Here we see we have 27 millimeters and 28 millimeters. If we have typical zooms on clouds, something like here, I would rather expect this focal length to be very big, 80, 90 or 100. Now we can see it. We see 173 here, so even more. And there's an easy rule of thumb here. You can expect more landscape focal lengths whenever you have a huge amount of clouds in the photo, something below 28 and 24. And of course, we won't always click each photo, but you can try to get a hang of it and see which photos are more dynamic, which are wider, and which are more of a crop of parts of the sky. And you know, we don't need to go crazy with choosing a focal length. We will not find the perfect focal length, but we are looking for something similar. And interestingly enough, we can use a wider photo if our camera is dynamic in the first place. We will get away with such a situation. The sky will be just more epic with a greater than life feeling and there's no wrong in doing that. If your focal length is pretty narrow, then your error margins are thinner. So keep that in mind. And as always, use references. We sound like a broken record now, but that's the best way to train your mental benchmark about anything, especially in art. Try to identify your focal length and the focal length of your references. Look at the number of clouds and their sizes to avoid too many blunders in your work. Moving on. This is the very last aspect and we will start doing stuff in just a second. The last thing worth paying attention to is the horizon line. The readability of this space is very important. If we will try to crop this picture, for example, over buildings, it suddenly turns out that the clouds are just starting at a certain height and we will lose a lot of the information that is here. The color gradient is the greatest around this area and we definitely want to introduce it to our images, both in terms of realism and technical correctness. Okay, that's about it. Uh, who had thought that there's so much to be said about cloud? But we hope that it inspires you to think about clouds differently and pay attention to certain things. Maybe it's a lot, but it comes quite intuitively after a while. And just to reiterate, uh, think if you need the clouds and how dramatic you want them to be. Avoid any low resolution, blurry images that come with flares. Check if the sun direction match. And at the same time, focus on the focal length. Eventually, you'll end up with potential candidates through elimination. It might be difficult to do uh, perfectly, but um, you know, with time, you'll learn what your resources are and what might work. Okay, now let's figure out how to replace that pesky sky in the right way. So we have our scene just like we left it recently, but now there are no trees that cast shadows in the foreground. And that's because we will return to the foreground with water in this scenario. And we want to start with a clear situation. So immediately we are going to turn off this layer with moss. Here, I will turn on this over low poly assets so that I can go interactive right away. We will have our box behind the camera as standard and it will not shade anything here, but it will only limit the light from the sky a bit. 
it is in the same position as in the last scene. And just like earlier, we put in HDRI, we open the material editor and Corona bitmap. And for this scenario, we prepared PGSky 1935. This is one of our most commonly used HDRIs for sunsets. It has a nice relationship between warm and cold hues, as well as attractive illumination. You can also use 3D Collective 2051 attached to this training. So we will jump straight into the deep water here. Okay, and Corona Color Correct just to have more control over it. We attach and immediately go to interactive to see what it is. I will restart the stone mapping right away. We did the last scene with filming mapping, so we can do this one in ACES. The main thing is to add this tone curve on top of ACES, because otherwise we will have a hard time dealing with these shadows. As for the direction of the light, we will also be aiming for something similar to what we had. I will rotate it a little bit. And at the same time we see that we lost sunlight in the scene. Because as I said before, this can happen with the low sun. And what happens here is that we have our sun somewhere here behind those mountains. And here, the parameter of rising it in the vertical axis comes to our aid. As you can see, the sun has already come out here. We can notice these shadows are still deep, so we can try to brighten them up a little. So yeah, we have a similar direction of the sun as we had recently. We see that this sun is even lower on the horizon. The shadows are longer, but at least it shines through into our scene after we rise that HDRI. This is also why we got a horizon line visible in the glass here. So we'd have to copy that layer so that the sun is on the horizon and replace it in reflections and refractions override. Just to correct this small detail here. But at the same time, we see that we kind of lost our illumination, right? Because it suddenly turns out that most of this illumination comes from the reflection of the sun on the wall. And now, through this little trick, we just have the direct illumination left here. But that reflection aspect of the sun is already here somewhere below the horizon. So it turns out that this solution is not that easy. And we don't want to make it more difficult, so we will turn this override off and we will improvise this element in post-production. This is but a nuance and we don't want to lose all of our illumination while undressing it. Alright, uh, let's say we are finished with our mid-ground. We are still missing the background though, right? So just like in the second HDRI lesson, we will do a global volumetrics here. We'll put in a Corona volumetric material and we will hook it up here.
I will start by assigning a default gray color here and we will enter a distance value. For now it might be too intense, but we will reduce it in a moment. And we can see here that even though our scattering color is gray, the volumetric material tends to inherit the illuminant color. So if the sun shines warmly here, this volumetric material in the scene will also take these warm tones on. I might also increase this directionality parameter here, but I will not explain it yet. We'll talk more about this in our volumetric lessons. For now, just trust us and we see that something is changing here in this illumination. And when it comes to color, we can add a blue tint, which, as you can see, decreases the feeling of warmth. We can also weaken this aerial perspective here. Okay, we've got our background toned down. It came together pretty well, maybe just except for the color of the sky. In general, the sky is pretty bland, not interesting enough, but the issue of this scenario is that we want to replace it later on. So we are assuming it's something that will change and we won't care too much about it now. The foreground is illuminated, but to be honest it does not bother much. We have a shadow here in the back, so this whole edge of the tree is nicely readable and creates a kind of frame for us. We don't need to insert any additional box or a tree or anything else to make it work this time. And I think water also helps us increase that readability. So we don't always have to completely obscure this foreground. It is just important that we must be able to read the image hierarchy and make this composition play well. Here, in turn, we have water, so even if the sunlight falls directly on it, we won't get that distracting micro-contrast that otherwise we would get on the plants. And the problem solved itself on its own. We have a fairly uniform colors and reflections, so it looks pretty cool. And we can now render this image and go to the part that really interests us here, which is a post-production and sky replacement. Here we will switch to high poly assets. And we are going to improve the appearance of this glass, so of course we need a glass mask. And we have the glass mask from the previous lesson, so I won't be setting it up again here. But we may need a row reflection pass, which I will select here. Row component and reflect. Perhaps we could use it in post-production. I think it would be worth having it. Additionally, we can also set up normal reflection paths, as well as translucency. Previously, we changed translucency for all vegetation materials manually, and this time we'll take an easier approach and just render this element, thanks to which we'll be able to boost already existing translucency. Quick and sweet. And everything is already set up here. We can render. Okay, so our render is ready. We have various passes here. Translucency, reflect and raw reflect. Now we want this alpha to be applied to our saved image because we want to have an empty part of the sky to be replaced. And we can see that this alpha is just like the sky, so we'll save all these files as PNG. And here in this pop-up window we'll have alpha channel checked. Thanks to this, we will have this transparency multiplied and we will be able to replace the sky easily. Okay, we have our PNG in Photoshop and we can see that we uploaded it already and it has this alpha information applied right here. We have a completely transparent sky. We can put something under this layer and it will be visible in this part. 
So now there is the question of choosing proper replacement photo. And here the most important issue is whether we need clouds in this scene. Maybe a simple gradient of the sky is enough. Are they really necessary? And I would say it's not an absolute must-have composition-wise, but let's just call it love to have. What is more, this is a lesson about clouds, so we would really like to implement some variant of them here. So let's say we are going uh, with the clouds. And now the question is whether these are to be vivid, dynamic clouds that kind of build the composition on their own, or rather something that complements and completes the existing situation. And here I would be inclined to the latter options. This composition itself is pretty cramped in here. A lot is going on in it, so we don't want to overcomplicate it with an overly developed sky and any intricate cloud formations. We would rather keep it in check play for this composition or introduce something relatively calm. In the back of my head I remember that it is supposed to be something peaceful. We can see that the sun is shining from the right side, so I will be looking for more or less that direction of light. We don't need to nail it precisely, it is going to be very forgiving, but we just don't want to choose anything entirely different. And in general, I would also like to paste something here that will brisk our render. We'll talk more about it in the lesson on color contrast, but we can already mention that we want the sky to emphasize our color palette even more. We mainly uh, revolve around warm yellows in the highlights and uh, cool blues in the shadows, which by the way we get thanks to this HDRI so much out of the box. And we can compare it with the previous lesson where we worked a bit on these colors. And here this palette is already at this stage basically without any changes, very cool. So this is also the reason why we were willing to use this HDRI. Well then, from the photos we saw earlier in this lesson we chose something like this. So we have the light on the right side here. We have quite a wide variety of colors on these clouds and also this blue shade of the sky is visible. And of course the difference between the aspect of this photo and our render is quite obvious, so... We will only need a fragment of it. Let's crop a part of this image and put it somewhere here underneath. And of course, we can see that the exposure isn't the perfect fit out of the box, but this will be normal and we'll always need to modify it a bit. And as long as this adjustment is kept within, I don't know, 20 or 30% of the original, this is okay. However, if we put a photo with the exposure being totally off, and let's say it was exposed for the sun or something like that, we won't be able to adjust it properly and we need to avoid it. Okay, so I'm creating a new layer with curves, an adjustment layer, and simply I'm going to rise these levels of this backplate a little. I don't want this to get too bright because then we lose these colors. Okay, mm, perhaps it looks better in terms of what is happening here, but I would like to keep it a little lower. Well, I also chose a backplate where these clouds do not clash too much with the whole composition. I mean, we can see some slight blur here. We have one larger cloud that somehow sits there in this general composition, in a sense that it may not be playing entirely along it, but also not especially playing against it. It is neutral. It just enriches the whole with color. So, from the compositional side, I think it's okay. But basically, the problems start here. We can notice a few issues. First of all, we can see the quality of the sky in the background stands out from the quality of the render. We see some noise here, some JPEG compression artifacts, and this situation will happen regularly, especially if we crop from the original photo. So, it could definitely be better when it comes to quality. 
That's why we have treated the same base photo with Topaz Labs Gigapixel, which is a great tool for enlarging any pictures and getting rid of noise or uh, even some blur. It all worked fine for us, so now this picture here is twice as large, so we kind of need to reduce it. Okay, uh, it was something like this. Maybe with like a little more of it on the right side. So I would have to select it again. Yeah, there it is. It already fits better and we can see that this picture is there now. This photo is much clearer when compared to what was before. It is not perfectly fitted, but we can see that it has improved a lot here. I hope you'll be able to notice it through a video compression, but it really is much better. Okay, so now the problems start elsewhere namely on all such particularly jacked elements, vegetation, trees, but generally everywhere we see a so-called fringe on these edges of the render and the sky. And this is because it is the reminiscent of the sky that was rendered here before, and it was much brighter than what we have now. And even the fact that we have this alpha multiplied here does not deprive us entirely of this color of the sky that was here before. And it is kind of a technical characteristic that we will not be able to get rid of entirely. So even if we render it in 10 times greater resolution, of course the effect would be a bit easier to handle with downscaling then, but the fact that this fringe exists is sort of directly related to, for example, how the translucency material works and how anti-aliasing is calculated. This is something that will always be more or less present in this kind of border. If the backplate is replaced with something that differs significantly in terms of brightness levels or hue or saturation. Okay, so how to address it? And there are many ways to solve this problem. The first and simplest thing we can do is reduce it right here in Photoshop. Here in the layer tab you can select matting and the fringe and this will suppress this bright border. We can give it, uh, let's say, one or two pixels and we can see that this fringe level goes down a little, but we still have some elements of it present. If we type in one pixel, then it will behave similarly, and there is no bigger difference in this case. Certainly, this the fringe helps us a little here, but that's not a one-click solution. There are some artifacts here, but they do not bother us much in our perception of these trees. At the same time, we need to remember that if we had any transparent objects with alpha, some window panes or glass railings, behind which there would be a transparent background, this defringe operation would likely have some messy results. Above all, it's all about glass, so in these cases consider possibly applying a defringe just on a fragment of our render, by masking the rest with the version without having it applied. You know, just to somehow deal with the fact that suddenly there will be strange artifacts on all these transparent elements, which we do not want. Nevertheless, it's not our problem here as we don't have any semi-transparent surfaces. Well, it's a bit better, but still far from what we would like to have. And there is no perfect solution for fixing this situation in Photoshop. It always depends a bit on your render. Here, I will just copy this layer and will work on that duplicate. You could take that clone stamp tool over there, select all layers as our sample source,
and draw in the darken mode. And then you can manually clean this edge. However, it works so-so, because sometimes this brighter areas removal is too harsh and we lose the readability of the form of this tree here. The leaves get disattached just floating in the air. Obviously, if we zoom out, it starts to look okay. Definitely better than uh, this fringe that used to be here. So maybe I'll continue doing it roughly in a larger area here to have some better overview. We can see here that these levers are not so different anymore and we can't quite get rid of all those fragments in the darkened blending mode. Anyway, it's better, but it's not perfect. And this is generally not an ideal way to replace the sky. We will show you now how to do it in the right way, and it will require us to come back to 3D environment. But first, we'll come back to the layer where the fringe problem was, and basically we will turn it off. Only our replacement sky has left here, and I will expand it to fill the entire frame. I will just mirror it horizontally here and then I will yet mirror it vertically. Here we are and it doesn't need to be perfect because these parts won't be even directly visible. But if it happens that fragments of this sky are seen, for example in a couple of these gaps between branches right here, it won't be a problem at all. Okay, this can be done as simply as possible and we just save it as our backplate. It can be JPEG because we took our sky from the JPEG photo, uh, so we don't lose anything with this compression anymore. And now we have to get back to our scene. And we can create a Corona bitmap. Let's upload this backplate to it. Here I will switch to this interactive layers again, because I want to show you what it would look like. So this is our scene, the same as earlier. I will add the color correct here, and I will connect this to our direct override channel. We can see that something is going on here, but it looks absurd. This is because we still haven't mapped it. Here we have the environment mapping, and we need to assign a screen mode so that this picture is perfectly adjusted to what our camera can see. And here it is. We could do the same with the other overrides, because we would like the sky also to affect the reflection in the water. And okay, here it is. But there are other problems with it. That's all due to the fact that our replacement sky is this low dynamic range JPEG. So firstly, it gets modified throughout the tone mapping we set. If we didn't have the tone mapping applied, it would look just like the original. But of course, we need to use it for the sake of the remaining part of the scene, and it makes the sky look uh, kind of washed out. 
It may seem wrong, but it's not a big deal and it won't bother us too much. You will see. The other JPEG-related problem is more difficult to handle, and it concerns the fact that low dynamic range image won't give us that believable range of reflections that we got from HDRI. Whatever we do, JPEG will not shine the same as the HDRI. It won't have the same tonal intricacy. And in that case, we would have to give up on it to have this proper juicy illumination, but then the clouds wouldn't be reflected here, right? And unfortunately, this is a case that can only be solved by doing two renders. One rendering with full HDRI illumination, which is sort of what we already did in the previous step, maybe except for the sky replacement in the direct overwrite, and the second one with the reflection overwrite applied to get that water right. If not for this very part, we could easily skip the second step and just focus on direct overwrite, which should work perfectly fine. And then we will assemble both renderings in Photoshop. So okay, I can connect everything to a single map and just try to tweak a bit of gamma, a bit of contrast to bring this tone mapped outcome a bit closer to what we had before applying it. It's sort of the reverse engineering, but again, nothing very precise and I mostly focus on having that water reflection correct. Okay, and that's it. And at this moment we can render this image. Okay, so the image has been rendered and we need to save it now. And this one basic beauty pass is just enough for us. We are still saving it with the alpha channel on. And now this may seem counterintuitive to you. Because why were we replacing this sky here? Just not to save it now? But it all makes sense. So let's go back to our Photoshop scene and lo what's been just saved. And here we have it. We've got our new layer with alpha multiplied and there is our old sky underneath. And suddenly all that nasty fringe is gone. The sole fact that we have rendered this scene with this backplate makes it so that this anti-aliasing on these trees automatically took over these colors, even if they happen to differ a bit here. You know, even though they were altered by tone mapping and we had to counteract that here. Even though that was not perfectly the same as we have in the background here. Because this is such a small difference that we won't notice it. And so we won't have a problem with that fringe anymore. The only remaining issue is that we had to swap this reflection slot here because of this water appearance and we lost all these cool strong highlights coming from HDRI. But that's not such a huge problem either. Maybe I will remove it and I will add a mask here. Just here where we had these problems. And now I'm going to brush through those areas with black paint on the mask so as to remove them. However, we do not touch the rest of the scene. The illumination was great there. And of course, we still miss this part with the water here. We can immediately notice now that this brightness is different. And I like the old one, so I will add an adjustment layer here. The curve, modify it to bring it up, and at the same time, I will add a gradient in the mask to exclude all those areas beyond the water. And now I can adjust this mask a bit here so that this reflection is more related to this real seat, to this real illumination. We just want to leave part with the cloud and maybe tweak the brightness a bit yet.
Okay, it's better now. Everything seems more or less seamless. And now, yes, you can say that it is a lot of trouble because you have to render the image twice. However, this is a very specific case. Because, firstly, the replacement of this reflection slot drastically changed the illumination here. As we had the sunset at such a height and such materials in the scene, that suddenly these reflections were essential for the appearance of the scene. Normally we won't have to deal with such a huge change in this perception. Secondly, it was unusual that we wanted to replace this slot at all. That's all because of that water here. Under normal circumstances, it may not matter to us and we wouldn't have to override reflections at all and only affect the direct channel. So we had such a coupling of the two things that forced us to double render. However, normally we can take a shortcut, save a viewport or clay render and adjust the sky to it composition-wise. And that would require only one production render at the very end of this process. So just have this in mind. Okay, it's good then, but there are still a few elements apart from this backplate replacement that we are supposed to improve. The first is that we have that visible horizon here in the glass. And I have rendered this raw component reflection mask here to have 100% reflection in this window panes. Now I can use color range to select those areas. They're a bit different, so let's maybe start with this one. And I will take a couple of selections because this color isn't uniform. And I will just paint it in gently with the clone stamp tool. Of course, it's not perfect here, so it needs to be improved. And I agree that it is a pretty clumsy method, but, you know, whatever works. I will soften this mask and it should be just like it was. And likewise I can move on to this area. And here I don't even need a clone tool. That solid color should suffice. A bit of manual work, but ultimately, not that much of it. You know, I could have rendered it separately with the lowered HDRI position overridden in the reflection slot, 
and that would work without all that hectic mouse clicking. Possibilities are various and I just did the brute force way by hand. Okay, um, now we still have other render elements like translucency. And we can put this translucency here and set the blending mode to screen. We can immediately see how this vegetation just get unbearably bright, but we can tame it with a black mask and simply with a soft light brush apply this effect a bit where it is needed. And in fact, it gives us much faster result and much more freedom in deciding where we want it than changing this translucency for each object in the 3D scene. That's of course provided we have that translucency set up at all. Otherwise, we won't get anything in this render element and we won't be able to do anything here. Similarly, we also have a reflect pass that we could use to add some specular highlights on individual elements. But I have the impression that what is now absolutely should be enough for us. The only thing we could still do here is adding a vignette. And just like I did it earlier, we will add these points to the curve We will mask it black and now we will pour in some white to transparent gradients from the edges. This should give us the greatest amount of control over everything. Okay, this should be enough. All I can do now is try to fix that spot of light here on this stone because it really annoys me. I will try to do it similarly as in the previous lesson. So first I would like to suppress the color that came out here. And now I will apply the curve and use blending mode to limit it to just the brightest parts. Okay, somehow we managed to hide it. It could perhaps benefit a bit more from some additional shadow. Alright, now it feels better. And some shade basically could be added everywhere here. Okay, we have accomplished it. The colors I think are pretty nice out of the box thanks to that HDRI. I wouldn't change anything here. We can consider our post-production finished. It is such a very colorful image on the very brink of that Disney-like feeling, but I think it is still commercially viable in this form. We've seen that HDRI is a perfect way to illuminate sunset scene and learned how to replace the sky with pretty much anything we can find online. We also used a bunch of new useful tricks. This lesson also completes the huge segment in which we talked about direct sunlight. Since the next one, We'll jump straight into overcast scenario and we'll need to slightly shift the way we think about illumination. A lot of exciting stuff waiting for us, so I cannot wait to see you there.